My name is Vineet Chandar, and I have the honor, the privilege, and really the pleasure to serve as the coordinator for Hindu life here at Princeton University. This evening, I am especially pleased and delighted to welcome each and every one of you, and to, of course, welcome our special guests for East Meets West. This event is a conversation between two remarkable individuals, but also a conversation between communities, between faith traditions, between hearts. This evening's event is co-sponsored by a number of very hardworking student organizations, academic departments, and programs here at the university. And I'd like to just take a moment to acknowledge some of those folks. The ORL Hindu Life Program is one of the organizers of this program, along with the Center for African American Studies, the Carl Field Center, the Anthropology Department, the Princeton Hindu Satsangam Student Group, MANA, Hallelujah. We're so blessed to have the guidance of the deans at the Office of Religious Life, Dean Allison Bowden, Dean Paul Rauschenbusch, Dean Deborah Blanks, the guidance of the chaplain at MANA, my dear colleague, Blake Altman, and so many volunteers and dedicated students and community members and faculty members and staff here at the university at Richardson. Too many to name, but all so valuable, so important, and, and such a, a critical part of making this evening a reality. In just a few moments, I'm going to have the pleasure of, of bringing out my dear colleague, as well as our special guests, to kick the evening off. But before I do that, I just wanted to share a few words, really from the heart. I'm going to kind of depart from the script a little bit, because this program is really, for me, it, it, it transcends the script, so to speak. It transcends the formal logistics of bringing together two great speakers. For me, this is very personal. These are two personalities, two men of deep faith and love, who serve as role models, as guides, and as exemplars to me. To see them together, to hear from them together, it's really the fulfillment of a dream. And I feel so personally honored to be able to share that with everyone this evening. Both Dr. Cornell West, as well as His Holiness Radhanath Swami, have recently published memoirs. And in preparation for this evening, I was rereading those two great books, The Journey Home and Brother West, Living and Loving Out Loud. And I was just struck by so many parallels, and I think we might hear about some of those parallels but one thing that really struck me was that with both of those particular books, there were several instances where I had to put the book down and just say, did that really happen? Did that really just happen? You've heard the expression, too good to be true, and the more cynical or skeptical part of us might think when you read some of these really miracles, that both of these gentlemen speak about in their own, in share of their own experiences. 
we might be tempted to think it's just too fantastic, it's just too incredible, it's just too unbelievable in this day and age of, of cold, hard facts and reality. It just seems like something from a fairy tale. But having had the opportunity to get to know and to hear from and to learn from these personalities, I believe that it is true. And both of these individuals have taught me personally that miracles really can happen. One miracle I'm going to welcome on stage, but a miracle in my own life, is Reverend Paul Rauschenbusch, who many of you know. Paul is the senior religion editor at the Huffington Post Media Group. And for a few more weeks, at least, he is the Associate Dean of Religious Life at the Office of Religious Life in the chapel here at Princeton. And he's someone that has been really instrumental in bringing the Hindu life program and, and invigorating the Hindu community here. I can't think of a better person to introduce and to get us into the mood of East meets West than Paul, because everything that he does is a testament to the power of bringing traditions together, bringing people together in dialogue, in working together, in celebrating and uplifting one another. I'm honored and touched to call him not just a colleague, but a very deep heart friend. And I know that that friendship is going to continue and only grow stronger, even as his journey takes him away from Princeton and on to new and exciting chapters in his life. So without further ado, I'd like you all to give a very warm welcome to Reverend Paul Rauschenbusch, who will introduce us to our very special guest this evening, Dr. Cornell West and His Holiness, Radhanath Swami. Earlier, some of us had the privilege of uh, sitting with uh, Radhanath Swami and with uh, Dr. West at a dinner. And uh, uh, Swamiji uh, said as a blessing, it is a great pleasure to be with one of my oldest new friends. And I can see already that, this, uh, that we, are, we are witnessing a wonderful uh, gathering this evening. And uh, it is certainly my pleasure uh, to have been invited to participate in this. And uh, I also want to uh, extend my heartfelt thanks uh, to Vineet Chander, uh, who is our um, Hindu chaplain and our coordinator of Hindu life. Uh, He has been uh, instrumental in invigorating our wonderful Hindu program here at Princeton and is a wonderful colleague. And oh, Vineet, you haven't even begun to get rid of me. So, uh, so we're, we're just starting our, uh, our walk together. Um, so I want to start just by saying that um, East meeting West seems like a good thing to me. <laughs> you know. We meet in a lot of ways. We can meet on the football field or soccer, as, as you Americans call it. And we can meet in the diplomatic corps. We have met militarily. We've met in very serious economic competition. And it's also good, I guess, for East to meet West on 
religion or spiritual matters. But I also think we would be remiss if we didn't admit that East meeting West is also fraught. Religion and spiritualities are not, often as not our forums for differences and coming close together, sometimes our perspectives, the differences can be amplified and those differences do not always lead to a deeper appreciation or affection for one another. So East meeting West is not necessarily a recipe for, we have a, where's Sheikha? We have a great student here who, who uses the word delicious for things that are kind of good, people, places, things, events. Oh, that was delicious, which I love. But East meeting West can be a not such a delicious fusion. You know what I'm saying? It can be a little harsh. But what we're trying to do here tonight and already successfully is that we are coming and we are having East meet West in a very special and beautiful way because we're coming at it with a heart that desires, that desires one another, desires to know one another, desires to love one another, desires to gain in respect and learn something from one another. We are coming together with a heart that is shared these two wonderful thinkers, spiritual leaders, intellects, activists are coming together to give us a heart where East might meet West and we might share a heart together. Sometimes you have a puzzle in your life and you have that peace and you're looking for that peace. Maybe tonight the person who doesn't share our tradition will offer us that little piece and we'll put it in there and we'll say, ah, oh, I see my tradition even more beautifully now that I have the whole puzzle in front of me, all the pieces maybe snapping together. And this, this, these two wonderful men here tonight have both recently released autobiographies, as Vineet mentioned. And I think that's very important because we're not really here working in the abstract. We're actually here about lived life. Life that's, that's, that's difficult, that's painful, that you're trying to wrestle through things. And they've both been so honest about that for themselves. And that's where we find one another in our vulnerability. That's where East can miss, meet West and we don't try to win. And so that's what I'm excited about tonight. And I also want to say that Dr. West, I would love it if Dr. West represented the West. <laughs> I would love it if Swami G represented the East in all its entirety. But that's never the way it happens. And so what we are doing here is actually coming as people. Each one of you as people are two honored, honored guests as people. And we are here together simply as sojourners seeking. And so, and these two have seen, you know, they have been in the street and they have been in the academy. They have been, both of them have had experience in the East and the West and the North and the South and in heaven and... <laughs> Enough of all of that. You know what I'm getting at. I'm getting at tonight is a night where if we do this right, we will all lead, leave here with hearts stronger, minds clearer, uh, love more intentional, a little bit deeper in our own faith traditions, respecting one another who have different faith traditions, and walking out of here singing and dancing. So that's what I'm hoping for. I am, uh, I'm going to uh, briefly introduce these two wonderful people, but um, I'm going to move out quickly. But all I want to say, I'm going to start with uh, Dr. West, who is, of course, a university professor here at Princeton. He's the class of 1943 professor. Um, he is, uh, 
you know, a seminal book that will be read for generations called Race Matters. His last book, Brother West, is a wonderful, if you're looking for a meditation, it's a wonderful place to start. Um, more than that, for those of us who are honored to be at this university, he is such a public citizen of this university. He is there. He is part of our community. He is not an academic who's up there. He's with us. And he, I, as, as I, I am leaving the, uh, not really leaving the academy, but I'm leaving Princeton, I have to say, as I have said before, he is the best hugger in the academy, and I encourage all of you to experience it at some time in your life. <laughs> Radhanath Swami uh, is uh, also an incredibly teacher. He's been uh, 30 years a bhakti yoga practitioner and teacher. Uh, he, has the, he is the founder and director of Radha Gopinath Ashram in Mumbai, India. And there's many more things to say. What I really want to say is that because of his teaching, because of his, um, his spiritual practice, 250,000 individual souls are fed every day in India. Now that's what we're talking about when we talk about spiritual activism. And I want to segue using that example into our conversation tonight. What we're going to do is we're going to start with each of um, uh, Swamiji and Dr. West will each speak for about 10 to 15 minutes on the topic of God, love, and spiritual activism from your own tradition. God loves spiritual activism. And I think one of the best ways to proceed in an evening like this is to not assume knowledge. You know, come at it, you know, really assuming that we don't really know, because many of us don't. And, uh, and I've, been a, I've been a Christian a long time, but I, you know, hearing you talk about Christianity, I'm going to learn something. So don't assume anything for both of you. Enjoy this. And, and so we're, gonna, we're going to have each of you speak, and, um, and then uh, we're going to have some uh, Q&A that have already been um, filled out. So without any further ado, I want uh, both of you, I don't know if you've decided who wants to go first, but this will be also a lesson in <laughs> working it out, so I'm not gonna say. I do whatever His Holiness would like me to do. <laughs> would, would you like me to start the word? It's up to you. Whatever makes you happy, Dr. <laughs> <laughs> I think you should probably begin. <laughs> His Holiness first. Absolutely. As your puppet, I will dance. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Om Akyanti Midandasya Gyanan Janachalakaya Chakshurun Militam Jena Tasmai Sri Gurave Namaha. I am deeply honored and grateful to be here this evening with Dr. Cornell West, with Reverend Paul, and with all of you in Princeton University. Actually, I only went to one semester of a junior college, and then I ended up in a cave in the Himalayas. <laughs> but somehow or other, I'm talking to all of you at Princeton. That's, that is a miracle of God's grace. Forty-one years ago, I was in Kandahar, Afghanistan. 
I was hitchhiking from London to India. And I was sitting on a dirt floor in a simple tea stall. There were five or six very, very poor people who were squatted down <coughs> drinking tea. And I was one of those poor people. Then mm-hmm. something happened that changed my whole perspective of life. A boy walked in, perhaps 16 years old, in desperate poverty. His clothes were soiled, torn rags. He was emaciated, thin. But what quaked my heart and turned my stomach was when I looked at his eyes. He was blind. His eyes were swollen and grossly discolored and disfigured. He carried in his hand a branch from a tree and on one side was nailed to it a tin can that was all rusty and there was a metal string that was strung across and then nailed to the other side. This boy started playing. Long, 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 long. And as he was playing, he sang. He sang about his love for God, for Allah. As he was singing, his face illuminated the room. His smile was ecstasy. We were in rapt attention. He sang for almost an hour. And I remember sitting there on that dirt floor questioning my entire existence. I was born and raised in northern Illinois. And I was taught that real happiness in life is to have money, to have beauty, to have health, to have power. And that's what I was going to school for. But this boy had nothing. He was impoverished, he was diseased. He was blind, but I could tell you, he was the happiest person I had ever seen up to then in my life. And I had to question, what really is happiness? What is the purpose of life? What is everyone really looking for? It shattered my conceptions. When I was a teenager in the 1960s, I was deeply troubled. I was questioning, how could I be content living in this peaceful suburb when just a few miles away the African-American people were prisoners of a ghetto. How could I be happy when my elder friends were being forced into the horrors of the Vietnam War? In my confusion, I was reading a lot of books and became very much attracted to some serious activists of the time. 
Dr. Martin Luther King. And I remember him writing that the irony of our time is that we have guided missiles, but misguided men. Malcolm X, other leaders of the counterculture. With a burning fire in my heart, I connected myself to the civil rights movement, to the counterculture. I remember being in one march with the lady associate of Martin Luther King, and bottles and stones were thrown at me by my white brothers and sisters. And I wondered, where do I fit in? I wanted to see a change in the world, but what could I do? I read that famous quote of Mahatma Gandhi, that we should be the change we want to see in the world. And even though I was rebelling, revolting, demonstrating, I saw within myself the same basic core disease that was the cause of the people I was revolting against. Mm -hmm. And I realized that if we want to change the world, we have to change our heart. Change should have a strong foundation. If you, it says in the Bible by Lord Jesus that if you build your house on shifting sand, then the first storm will cause it to collapse. But if we build our house on solid rock, no storm can break it. Mm. Mm. Our ideals that we hold sacred in our life, unless we have a strong internal foundation, then the storms of temptation or fear or physical emotional pleasures will cause what we stand for to collapse. And I believed very strongly that that foundation must be spiritual. So I started seeking what I believed to be the common essence of all spiritual paths. And where I could practically apply myself to do something for God and for the world. It was about that time, when I was 19 years old, that I set out to hit on a, actually it was a summer vacation during college. My parents were happy that I was coming back. But I didn't come back. The spiritual longing intensified and intensified as I studied Judaism, Christianity, and then hitchhiked through the Middle East, studying Islam, and eventually came to India. There I came to the path of bhakti after studying many different traditions. Bhakti is the path of service with devotion as a way of expressing our love for God. There was a beautiful passage in a special book called the Srimad Bhagavatam that deeply affected me. Savai pung sho paro dharmo yato bhakti radhokshaje ahoitaki aprati hata yagatma suprasidati. That the supreme dharma or religion is that which awakens 
loving devotional service to the Supreme Lord. To awaken within us the genuine inspiration to be an instrument of God's compassion within this world. Such service must be unmotivated by any selfishness, egoism, and uninterrupted by any type of impediment that may come before us in order for that to completely satisfy our hearts. When I was young, I heard a statement, if we do not have an ideal we're willing to die for, we have nothing very meaningful to live for. And I understood the strongest, deepest foundation that could create stability and integrity in any situation in this world. And the highest ideal is love. Unmotivated, uninterrupted love. In the Bible, it is said the first commandment is to love God with all your heart, mind, and soul. And the natural result of that is you will love your neighbor as yourself. This is the universal principle. My beloved guru, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, he would tell us that true religion is not to be a Hindu or a Muslim or a Christian or a Jew or a Jain or a Parsi or a Sikh or a Buddhist. True religion is that which wake, awakens selfless love for God and love for every living being. Because when love of God awakens in the heart, its natural expression is compassion. There's a beautiful verse in the Bhagavad Gita. Vidyavanaya sampane brahmani gavihastini suni chaiva sopake cha pandita samadarshana. True wisdom is not simply storing data in one's brain. True wisdom is the ability to see every living being with equal vision. Whether one is black or white or red or yellow or brown, male or female, rich or poor, eastern or western, whether one is a human or an elephant or a cow or a dog or a cat, true wisdom is to see that life is sacred. And this is the principle of the Gita, which is foundational to the wisdom of the East. so jiva loke jiva bhuta sanatana. This means every living being is part and parcel of God. Aham bija pratapita that God is the supreme mother and father of everyone. And when we love God, we naturally, spontaneously, learn to love every living being because we understand our relationship. Paradukaduki, this is the quality of an actually enlightened person, according to the Vedas, that one sees another person's suffering to be my own suffering, and another person's happiness to be my own happiness. Compassion, it's the basic universal principle, transformation of character, is what true spirituality is meant to achieve within us. When we recognize the sacredness of who we are, 
as a child of God, the all-attractive, the all-loving. We can have the strength to overcome every obstacle. It is not about who we are socially, what we do, or what we have. These things may change, they will change. But the real truth is we are all brothers and sisters. We are all sacred children of the one supreme truth. And to live by that principle is what the Vedas explain to be the supreme essence of human life. Booker T. Washington, he had said that I will not allow any man to degrade my soul by causing me to hate him. He was an emancipated slave who had every reason to hate, but he loved. This is the teaching of the Bhagavad the Gita. This is the teaching of every great scripture. We may hate the disease, but if we know ourself, our own true value, then we will have the power to love even those who are emotionally, morally diseased. This is the greatest need within the world today. I remember in a place called Brindavan, where I had connected with my own spiritual teacher, Srila Prabhupada. And he was explaining how everything within this world is potentially spiritual according to our consciousness. Om Purnamada Purnamidam, Ishopanishad tells, everything is emanating from the one supreme truth. Therefore, everything is connected. When we see other people, other things, our abilities, our wealth, as God's property, and use it accordingly, then we see the spiritual significance of everything within this world. And we can be agents of real change. But if we see things from the point of view of I and mine, mm. 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 Dr. West, mm. in your book you write about how when we are motivated by physical pleasure and property and power, it, cor it corrupts us. And today all over the world in great educational institutions there are so many precious tools being given. but to make real positive change within the world and find real satisfaction of our hearts, this universal principle of a spiritual foundation is so deeply important mm. to cultivate. My spiritual teacher, Srila Prabhupada, when he was 70 years old, he left a holy place, Brindavan, to go on a cargo ship for 38 days to New York. Mm. He had seven dollars, and he didn't know a person here. 
He didn't go for himself. He came here simply for the purpose of being an instrument of God's love. When he was asked by a journalist, we have our own religions here, why have you come? He shared his heart. I have not come here to convert. I've come to enlighten, to remind you of what we've forgotten, that love of God and compassion toward every living being is our very essence. It's within all of us. It simply must be revived, awakened. Spiritual activism is the very nature of a person who's really in being connected to their own true self. In our tradition, we chant mantras or the names of God to awaken this spiritual essence within ourselves. Essentially, thank you very much, we can be empowered to care for people or to help people when we deeply, really, and truly care. Care is the symptom of love. In reading Dr. West's book, I was feeling so deeply connected because although we're so different, I felt this man is really a soul brother. <laughs> I mean, I've been celibate for 41 years, and according to his book, he didn't follow the same way. And, you know, he's got all these PhDs and graduations, and I went to one semester of junior college. Um, according to what I read, he doesn't have all that much m more money than me, and I have nothing. <laughs> Just a, f a few days ago, I spoke at the HSBC bank headquarters in London, and. 850 bankers were there and several CEOs. I was speaking. <laughs> and wherever you put me, I am what I am. It's, what can I? <laughs> I began the talk by explaining I'm very honored to be with all of you, especially considering you're all some of the greatest bankers from the great, one of the greatest banks in the whole world and I haven't had a bank account or signed a check in 40 years. <laughs> and I told a story how I was in a college in Bombay. It was a it was a college for chartered and certified accountants. There was about 400 people in the room. And I was standing at a lectern and I gave my talk, whatever I say. And I dared to ask this assembly of Indian college students if they had any questions. <laughs> and one student raised his hands and I called on him and he stood up and everyone in the room went, ooh. <laughs> I understood this man is very popular and very charismatic. Mm. Mm -hmm. 
He screamed at me. He said, everything that you have spoken in this class is totally useless. You are a cheater. You are misleading everyone. What if everyone in the world became a swami like you? <laughs> Who would grow the food? Who would do the banking? Who would run the governments? Therefore, you are a cheater and I reject you. He got a standing ovation. <laughs> oh, oh my God. <laughs> and I had to wait a couple minutes till the, <laughs> till the roar of the crowd settled down. And then everyone looked at me like, what are you going to say? <laughs> and you know what I was thinking? What am I going to say? <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, I said a little prayer. Because <laughs> that's all we have sometimes. <laughs> that's the truth. That's the truth. Yeah. And then I turned to that boy and I said, What if everyone in the world became an accountant like you? Mm. Who would grow the food? <laughs> Who would do the banking? Who would run the governments? In fact, if everyone in the world became an accountant like you, there would be 100% unemployment because no one would need an accountant. <laughs> Just like this human body, the head has its function, the arms have a very different function. The legs have another, the heart another, the liver another. They're all very unique. Many of them can't do what the others can do. But every part of the body is working together in the service of the whole body. The world needs farmers. The world needs bankers. The world needs professors. The world needs mothers. The world needs business people. The world needs accountants. <laughs> At least I think. <laughs> and Swamis could do something in this world, too. <laughs> whether it's our religion, whether it's our sex, whether it's our preferences, whether it's our, um, our nationality, our education, our qualification, our proclivities, Real culture is to honor, respect, and appreciate people because we understand on a spiritual level we are all connected. And like different parts of the body, we all work together for each other. And there's nothing that will give greater pleasure to the Lord than that. To help people physically, emotionally, and spiritually is the greatest need. And to be an instrument of a power that is infinitely beyond our own power of grace is the greatest blessing. I thank you very much.